everyone and welcome to another edition of the Weekend Wrap brought to you by Crowcast. My name is Phoenix, it's great to be with you again and joining me is Maka. How are you doing mate? Oh jeez, how often do I do this honestly? I'll just unmute you Maka. <laughs> <laughs> you think after 950 podcasts I would have learned how to use this freaking software but anyway... How are you, Max? I'm, I'm used to getting muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should dear. start calling you Cornsy. Yes, yeah, don't ever do that, please. <laughs> I'll get that, sacked. <laughs> yeah, that is nasty. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. Not fair at all. Uh, how are you, Nikki? I'm very well. Pleased to hear it. Now, an interesting weekend of results, uh, notwithstanding our good win on the weekend, but. Uh, Today's results really smashed me, so uh, yeah, I'm not happy about it. So without further ado, why don't we get into it, eh? Jay Mac, love that song. My God. Uh, all right. So as I said, today's a. Uh... <laughs> Today's results absolutely killed me um, on my tipping. But anyway, let's go back to the beginning. And it was Wednesday, Wednesday, which also killed my tipping because I forgot that there was a match on Wednesday. So I hence forgot to put in my bloody tips, but never mind. Um, and it was the Tigers getting up over a very, 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 very disappointing <laughs> demon team. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, 85 to 42. Did you guys watch it? Uh, yeah, and I did watch it, and uh, Melbourne are gone at the moment. They're shot. They're, they've got nothing. Um, I, I don't. I, they apparently they did a little bit like we did in two thousand seventeen, uh, two thousand eighteen. Sorry, come back uh, not quite as fit as they should be, and uh, they're still trying to do catch up. But uh, they're playing very, very poorly. I didn't watch it mostly because I knew it wasn't going to be a good quality game because Melbourne were involved. There, <laughs> there's something wrong between the ears. Um, but I think we got allusion to that last year with them complaining about the preseason, and it seemed that this preseason it was they went a bit softer on the players than what they did last season, and I think it's showing that there's a that's sometimes a little bit of a problem when the players have too much say. Yeah, well, I reckon we might have suffered with a bit of that at the beginning of the year too, you know? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, I've got a theory on that actually while we're starting to improve. We've only started to improve since Pikes once started wandering down <laughs> yes. to the boundary and ignoring <laughs> the other coaches up there. Yeah. yeah, we will talk about that, Mac, when we get to the review. <laughs> yes. Uh, Thursday night, a pretty entertaining game in the end. Uh, Collingwood getting up by four points over a spirited Essendon team, 73-69. to 69. Um, I thought halfway through the first quarter it was going to be a blowout, but uh, the uh, the Bombers certainly made a game of it. Yeah, that, that was a very good game, wasn't it? It was a, a really good game to watch. Um, like you, I thought it was going to be a thrash match early in the piece when yeah. the Pies got, they just jumped them early with their good midfield, but um, I'll say this about this, and the, the gun and run style, uh, they just kept at it and at it. And uh, and when they when they started to get it going a little bit, when Collingwood started to try just a little bit, um, there were some 50-50 decisions and which didn't go their way. And um, I know the umpiring uh, department say all those decisions were correct, because I, but they will always say that anyhow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, look, it was touch and go. It could have gone either way. And uh, well played, isn't it? But uh, Conwood got the, the four points. Did you see it, Nick? Uh, I'll, I'll, yes, I will. Um, <laughs> I'll have a little bit to say in the Cock Wombly None of the Week Award regarding that game okay. and the umpire. Um, it would be – I think it would have been interesting um, if that game was a bit fairer. <laughs> Uh, in terms of how it should have been umpired. But uh, it really did set the, the tone for how lax they were going to be on holding the ball for the rest of the round. Um, but as PJ Crows has said in the, the chat, that Collingwood <coughs> are showing signs of final-style football. Um, 
and I've liked watching them for the past two seasons. I actually think they play a very attractive style of football, but also a very hard style, which is what you need. Um, yeah, I agree with they're that. De- they're definitely one of the form teams of the competition at the moment. Yeah, no doubt. I agree with that as well. I think they're just looking rock solid. They seem to be well organised and good players on every line. So uh, they're going to be there or thereabouts. I reckon you're right. Um, Friday night, uh, another pretty entertaining game actually. Port getting up over North Melbourne, eighty-eight to seventy-two. I don't know whether it overstates Port's form though, because um, aside from us, North haven't been going that well. I thought the most significant thing in that particular game was watching Connor Rosie and spewing that we actually allowed Port to outmaneuver us uh, at the trade table or at the drafting table. Um, that guy is going to be one of the best footballers in the AFL for many, many a year. Um, this is his first year. He, uh, that was the thing that, that really, really came out of the game to me. Uh, Port aren't playing bad footy, actually, by the way. That, that hurts to say that too because um, their midfield is very good. Uh, Boat. It just shows how bad a coach they've got to have that midfielder sitting on a half forward flank for two years, two years, mouldering away. When he, when they, as soon as they put him back in the midfield, he stars. It just shows how poor they've been, poorly they've been coached before Montgomery's come there to put, give them some fresh ideas. The problem they've got though is um, Bobby Gray broke. Is it Robbie Gray? I think yeah, it was broken hand. Yeah, who's out for about a month. Yeah. So I yeah, think that's gonna that will that's gonna that's gonna hurt them quite a bit. The the other thing on, on Rosie is um I think as Pete kind of described him quite well, is that he's very good at everything, but he doesn't have any one outstanding um attribute, you well, know, I that he's know like that. I, I think no, I said he's very good at everything. But he's very even about it. But the problem is the team that he's been put in. So we all saw how Pal Pepper came onto the scene really well and, and played really well that first season. And the same with Ollie Wines. But they can't develop them, which is such a pity for, I think, for these players. I, 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 think, think, I think Rosie will have a very good career. But I think if you put him in almost most other teams, he would have an even better one. I think there's going to be a problem in terms of um, in terms of his full on development because there are there are problems at that club about that. I couldn't uh, disagree Nicky, with you more, Nick. Yeah, I was going to say you beat me to it. Yeah. I reckon Connor is raw talent, and uh, I reckon the the strength that he's got is just that he knocks up getting the ball. Uh, he's <laughs> always in the play. He's always getting the ball. And if you've got a bloke with that amount of talent getting the ball as often as he's getting it, uh, then look out. Um, because yeah, that's that's and, what I said. He's and, very good. He's very very good at everything. Yeah. Well, it, well, the person he reminds me most of is Fife. The um, with more, a little bit more pace than Fife, and I think that he, he might end up being better than Fife. Yeah, I, I think my um, my. I, I don't disagree with your analysis of Port's development, Nicky, at all. But um, I, I think the players that you used as as comparisons were not the same kind of player. Both were big bodied kids, uh, Ollie Wines and Pow Pepper. They're both man yeah, children. Connor's not like that. He's getting by on pure talent at the moment. He's got. He's still got to develop his body. Um, he's got no right to be as influential in games as he already is. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> I would have. I mean, I love Chase, uh, but I would have given. Uh, uh, we would have had to give my, up a part of my anatomy Him and for us to get up to right, get look, Rosie. Yeah, but Rosie's a R- Rosie's a two hundred game player. Um, are we confident that Chase Jones and Ned McHenry are going to be two hundred game players? Uh, I think this is going to be a question that's going to be asked for a long time when people sit down and analyse our 2018 draft is Good point. not so much not getting up to get Luco and Rankin because they were, you know, out of reach. But the fact that Port basically trumped us in getting up high enough to get Connor Rosie uh, and we had the currency and we chose not to use it um, and history is going to be a pretty harsh marker on that one, I reckon. 
Mm, the, I'm, the one, I'm in the same the one thing though, we, we did we did talk about leading into the draft. We did talk about Rosie and the one knock on him is that he didn't have that speed, which is what we need, which Chase Jeez. Jones does have. Jeez, which, I tell you, there's nothing Henry, wrong with Rosie's speed. I was watching him. Oh, and, I think he's done actually a lot better than what most people thought. Um, but also on that though, Fiend, I would say that he actually has a bit more maturity than a lot of the other draft, the draft um, players that he did because he's played in the SNFL and he played in the SNFL consistently. Yeah. That's because he's good, Nicky. So that helps. I think it's because he's good, yeah, because uh, Jackson Haightley played in the SNFL too and he can't get a gig at GW, GWS at the moment. Um, you know, Lukosius is only just going uh, up at the Suns. Um, so, yeah, look, it's a discussion for another time, but uh, it'll be. In, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out in hindsight. Um, Saturday night, we had uh, the Lions getting up over the Suns. The Suns are just tapering off at the moment, I reckon, after a good start. Uh, the Lions getting up uh, 111 to 62 in the Q Clash. Uh, so, yeah. a good bounce back win by Brisbane. Well, yeah, one of the most fun watch, really, games I've watched, but um, not much to say there. Um, I, I think that, that travel has just really hit the Suns. As I said last week, we got the Suns at the right time. Yeah, but, you know, being Brisbane Lions weren't that good. Uh, it, it wasn't a very high standard game, I didn't think. No, it wasn't It wasn't a great game. Um, but, you know, a win's a win, I guess, for Brisbane at this time of year. Yep. Um, what else have we got? Uh, obviously, our game, we had the Giants giving me a scare early when they let Sydney get in front of them for a little while, but ending up uh, a comfortable win uh, in the Battle of the Harbour. Or what do they call that? What do they call that in <laughs> Sydney? It is called exactly that, Battle of the Harbour. Oh, is it? Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have been Because they're further up the harbour. Yeah. Uh, 120 to 79. So the Giants just ticking over at the moment and uh, just uh, racking up wins. It would have been a bigger win, except for the fact that Whitfield uh, got a very bad corky in the in the first quarter, and uh, they kept bandaging his leg and keeping him on and up at full forward with virtually no influence on the game. But uh, he had started the game off as he has been playing all all year in dominating fashion. Uh, Cornelio, Cornelio had a outstanding first quarter and he got a bit of a knock too which slowed him down a bit but um, I think Sydney are in a very bad place at the moment um, because even, even with the uh, injury, uh, Davis didn't play either for GWS um, even with the injuries with uh, GWS and the players soldiering on with them um, I, Sydney haven't got a lot at the moment they really haven't got a lot and uh, uh, I've Perhaps Bottle being out for them might be a very good thing to actually go to the draft and get a couple of good youngsters and uh, start rebuilding it and for a future assault because they're not going to win a flag for a long time with that with the squad they've got there at the moment. Uh, I think... Well, they, um, sorry, Nico. I was just going to say, they kind of don't... haven't had to bottom out because they've had access to so many great academy kids. Um, well, plus they've had... But I, I think it's... Yeah, and, and the cola the fact that they don't have the collar anymore is really kind of killing them um, because they used to be able to attract um, more of those players to put around those good kids, et cetera. Um, and, and we've seen that the exodus that actually happened. I mean, we looked at the ones who did leave and we thought, oh, yeah, that's fair enough because, you know, they're, they're getting on in age, et cetera. Um, they're slowing down. They're, you know, injury prone. I actually thought there was, you know, some pretty good decisions, but I, I do wonder whether it's a bit too much of a stale game plan from somebody who's been there too long. Well, there could be a bit of that. Could be a bit of that, Mm. Nick. I reckon Um, he has been there for a while now, Um, but I do think that we're starting to see the the end of that squad, and they haven't, like as you rightly pointed out, they don't have the same access now. They've still got obviously the academy, but. Um, they don't have the the space in the cap now, um, so no. they're still they're still playing tip, paying Tippett, aren't they? As well, which yes. impacts yes. their their TPP. So I mean, I I think I don't think we're going to see the bounce from Sydney that we saw, uh, you know, the the previous seasons where they've started slowly and then come home like a train. I, I don't. Not this year. 
I, I think it's a combination, Nick, of um, the, the squad just getting to the end of its life and also, as you mentioned, uh, Longmire, maybe his message getting a little bit stale. Um, and and, w- and we know exactly how they play and everybody knows how to counter it. Yeah. Mm. Well, and see, they were grooming um, Stewie Jew for quite some time to take over that job. Uh, so the fact that he jumped ship and went to uh, Gold Coast uh, has probably left them in a bit of a quandary as, in regards to what they do with that coaching position. Um, but, yeah, as you know, as we're all saying, that they don't look the, the force that they've been in previous seasons. Yeah, look how Josh Kennedy's performed since Jew's not around coaching that midfield. Yeah, well, I mean, you don't forget how to play. I reckon Kennedy's just starting to, to get on. How old is he now, 29? Yeah, oh, and it, and, all of and that. he's and and he's been that centre of that midfield, and he was the in and under and the bash exactly. and crash yeah. with that bigger body player. So I think that's, I think it's a bit of column of everything. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, interesting to see how they track over the next next month. Another interesting team at the moment is Fremantle, just sort of ticking over nicely, uh, getting up over the Bulldogs at home. So not the uh, not the hardest uh, fixture for them, but they still have to win the game, and they, they won by 19. They did after a good start, um, 88 to 69 in the end. Um, uh, the Bulldogs will always put up a bit of a fight, though. They're that kind of team. Um, it's, I reckon it's hard to blow the Western Bulldogs off the park, irrespective of how they're playing, because they do hit the scoreboard a bit. No, well, you don't have to be that good because I think the coaches there's a problem for them as well. Beveridge. Um, you know, I watched his game last week uh, the, where he moved McRae, his uh, pr- uh, prime gun in the midfield, put him to a half-forward flat, put uh, his clearance king, Liber- Liberatory, to a forward pocket and, and lost the game. Uh, and um, he st- pulled a few more stunning moves again in this particular game. The biggest problem that they have, though, that they don't have any tools. And so uh, anybody that's got per- players that can mark up forward will always beat uh, uh, Western Bulldogs because of the fact that they're, they're shortish in the back lines and they're shortish in the forward lines. You know, yeah. well, well, they haven't got that, that tall marking player. So, well, they got but, one, but they put him in the back lines with Tim English. Oh, look, uh, this bloke can't coach. Beveridge can't coach. How he fluked a, a, a premiership, I do not know. I, I think but, uh, I think he's a very um, he's a bit like Ken Hinckley, I reckon. Uh, very good on the emotive stuff. Yep. Um, but not necessarily a clever tactician. Um, yeah, good summary. I, I think it's starting to show because um, you can that that emotive stuff only only works for so long, doesn't it? Mm. In, in the end, you know, the the message starts getting a bit flat. If you're going to rely on them, I think Malcolm Bly actually was a bit of that, although he did uh, also have a bit of a tactical nous as well. But I think. Malcolm played very much with the heads of the Crows players uh, at times and uh, it does have a short lifespan. Um, the other thing too, I think the Bulldogs, I think, are going to be... Uh, uh, they're threatening to be below Carlton at the end of the year. It's, it's a bit hard, annoying. It's hard to read at the moment, isn't it? I mean, Carlton are looking okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, they should have won today, actually. Um, but The uh, first half was brilliant. Yeah, and... Yeah, well, let's let's talk about the Carlton game. Carlton just going down by five points to Hawthorne in the end, ninety three to eighty eight. So the big thing about that is that Carlton are scoring more. They're hitting the board more, um, and uh, you talk about young jets. That Sam Walsh is a bit of a jet too. Um, yep. Uh, I think he's averaged more since they've started measuring. He's had averaged more disposals uh, in his first six games than any other rookie ever. He's averaging yes, like twenty six touches or something like that. Just, just mm-hmm. a, um, you know, you'd be pretty, pretty happy with your number one pick if you're getting that sort of out, output after six games. The one weakness in his game, and if, uh, when I say weakness, he's a, he's a, an average kick in the sense that he kicks an average distance. He hasn't got real long length in his kick, and that'll probably come as he gets a little bit older, a little bit stronger. But there, there is no weakness in his game, getting the ball and uh, or courage or marking a ball or anything like that. Uh, it's the only weakness I can see in his game is the length of his kick. But gee, he's a yeah, he's a, he's a very well deserved number one. There's no doubt about that. But oh, I think in the long run, I think I'd probably still rather have Rosie. Yeah, well, I I don't think you'd go wrong with either. Uh, Chris Judd wasn't a long kick, Mac, and he did it right. 
Yeah, true. true. <laughs> Sli- slightly different game style back then, though, to now. Yeah, I know, but it's still not a long kick. Um, right. And the final game, uh, West Coast. I tipped West Coast in a bit of an upset because they tend to do all right down there, but they got flogged. Oh, they got forty-six. They, they're um, they're only just going at the moment. West Coast murdered in the midfield. Um, it was just going Geelong's way most of the most of the game, and. Uh, yeah, really. I, I watched the game uh, in between. I watched mostly the Carlton game, and I went a little bit to the other one. And then I went back to that one after the Carlton game had finished. Um, whereas I enjoyed the Hawthorne Carlton game, there really wasn't much to enjoy about the Geelong West Coast game because it was just too one sided. And um, West Coast, I think um, it's amazing because you know this, this is the this this syndrome again of the Premier coming up the next year. Uh, they look very ordinary against Port Adelaide, getting thrashed on their own home ground, and uh, Geelong thrashing them again today. So they're not travelling that well at the moment, the West Coast. No, I don't think it's panic stations yet, Mac, but, you know, um, they don't look as convincing uh, as Collingwood, say, for example, uh, both teams with a late start to their pre-seasons, etc. But Collingwood looking far more solid than West Coast at the moment. The West Coast just seem to be... As you say, that they, they don't seem to have the strength in the midfield that they have had in previous seasons. I don't think they're getting as much out of their out of their midfield rotations, and uh, Kennedy's not getting on the end of uh, as much ball, and, and therefore not having as much influence. So, but you know, I mean, it's early days, and they didn't really rise to a prominent uh, premiership threat until late in the season last year as well. That's true, but at this stage, the two teams that stand out. Uh, from a premiership point of view, are Collingwood and Geelong, aren't they? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. And it shits me that Geelong are in that conversation, to be honest with you. <laughs> I hate it. Absolutely hate it. Um, just on the Bulldogs, because I've just looked up their results so far this year. So they've beaten um, Sydney. They really, they beat Hawthorne quite comfortably. They did lose that game to the Suns, which which was a very good game. I remember watching that one. They got beaten, but by not too much by Collingwood. Then they got smashed by Carlton, and then I, I think they were a bloody good chance to win that game against Frio. Except I think there was a lot to do with Monday's three hundredth um, and the, the effort of, for the whole team lifting um, in that last quarter about that. So, I, as you were saying before, Fane, I think the Bulldogs are they're going to snag a couple of wins. I think against sides that we would anticipate above them. But there's a little bit of inconsistency going on there in those results if you just look at what we consider the form teams are so far. Yeah. Yeah, they remind me a little bit of Essendon is in that they can get you. If you're not on, on your game, they play a style of football that can that can do damage. Mm, um, that's true. And But I I think your your assessment was dead right, Macca, that they just lack a tool. They, they lack someone. I mean, uh, you know, Boyd's not there and... Um, they tried Carlisle and that didn't work, did it? So, well, they're short. They're definitely a short team. Yep. Anyway, uh, enough about them. Let's talk about us, shall we? And it was a pretty good win uh, in the end, I thought, uh, because St Kilda were up and about and in form, and it was hard to um, rate or hard to get a read on their on their form. Um, but they they were playing well. So in the end, Adelaide getting up fifteen goals seven ninety seven to St Kilda ten goals eight sixty eight, and probably a little bit flattering in the end for the Saints because we let them get a couple of cheapies at the end. So um, a pretty good pretty good twenty nine point win to the Crows, and um, just nice to see a couple of new faces and and a couple of old faces looking refreshed, don't you think? Mm, that's it's got quite a bit to talk about the game in the sense of not just the game but the tactics and the and the personnel that we used etc cetera, etc cetera. um it was interesting because at the start of the game we, we were just smashed early um i i don't i can't quite un, put my finger on why we were so uh we were only reactive rather than proactive for about the first 15 20 minutes and something was obviously wrong with our center setups etc and um the interesting thing is Pike came down about the 15 minutes. 10 minutes. Mark. 10 minutes, was it? And yep, same as he did the week before. 
And it was only after he came down and started talking to the players, we gradually started to start to look like a football team that we thought we are. And um, I don't know what was going wrong before that, but uh, the intensity of St. Kilda, I thought we were going to get blown away. And then um, then you gradually you could see the balance being restored and I started to feel a little bit more confident. Uh, but... Uh, the balance. By, the, by the end of the game, though, we were playing the way that we should be playing, and I think the structure of our team, and, and then I've been saying this for some weeks now, without Jenkins, looks better. Oh God, yeah, no, no doubt um, about that. Go, Nick. So the balance you were talking about there, Macca, was better. It was very simple. It was Greenwood and Ellis Yolman into the midfield. Yeah, you're a hundred bigger bodies. Hundred percent right, Nick. That are. So much. And then we sent Sloan forward because he was getting tagged. Um, and unfortunately, like he only had one possession in the, in the first quarter. Terrible. But food. we put him up forward. And well, because he was bloody being hung on to. And they, you know, the young pass were, yeah. Um, <laughs> but once he was down there, whilst he didn't get possessions, he did a lot of effective work in terms of that run and the, the pressure. And I think that's what lifted Murphy and the others, et cetera. Um, down there. But the interesting thing was our first three goals, contested mark on the forward line to Greenwood, no, to Betts, to Greenwood, to Walker. Three contested marks in our forward line. Mm. Yeah, when was the last time you were able to say that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're but- right, Nick. It was, the, it was the first rotation of that midfield uh, that changed the momentum uh, of the game uh, in that first quarter. Um, and uh, I watched it reasonably closely and whilst Alice Yolman didn't get a lot of the ball uh, in terms of clearances in that in that little period it was just the different makeup and I think also it also coincided with St Kilda's first rotation um, and I don't think they run as deep uh, as we do in terms of midfield rotation and I think when 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 the second shift came on uh, we were able to nullify a little bit more um, and start to wrestle a bit of control away from St Kilda um, and it, to be honest with you, it played out exactly the way I thought. I thought we might come out a little bit pleased with ourselves after having a good win last week, and it just it seemed to me that our intensity was just off one peg or so, and St Kilda play exactly the same as Gold Coast do. They're just a hard-working, hard-running team. And, uh, yeah. you know... Yeah, you, tackle, it, tackle, 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 get yeah. the ball out, run. Yeah, and that's right, They they and they... They like to bounce from half back, and they like they they run hard defensively, and all that sort of stuff. So we needed to uh, be with them uh, until the game settled, and you know that it could have actually been a little bit worse for Adelaide had St Kilda taken the most made most of their opportunities. Nine scoring shots to three in the first quarter. Uh, it could have been they six hitters. Well, that's it. Pardon me, I just bumped my mic, but that's that's exactly right. Um, so they did help by keeping us in the game um, in that first quarter um, and had they made more of their opportunities it might have been a different uh, dynamic in the game after that but it wasn't and credit to us we were able to stifle them and hold them to two scoring shots in the second quarter uh, whilst we we went on a six goal one tear so you know that's not something the Crows can always do so it's always good when you see them wrestle control back of a game Another point you made about uh, Cam Ellis Yolm and, and Greenwood was was a very good point because um, in the early stages of the game we were getting caught in the, especially in those midfield bounces with the loose man standing back and uh, it was mainly uh, Stephen. Yep, uh, and but that that got, when they beat them and the, those heavier bodies came in that got adjusted and also your point, Fiend, about the rotations as well. They didn't have somebody of the quality of Stephen to, to uh, carry on with the yeah. work that he'd been doing. But we were also then trying to prevent it as well. The loss of Loney, I think um, a lot of people have kind of missed because he provides that secondary run. So whilst you've got Stevens, Loney as well is also um, one of their great deliverers into their forward 50, um, and he's such a quality player. And that loss and putting the one rotation down, um, I, I don't think you can underestimate how much of an impact that also had on the game. Yeah, particularly when they don't bat that deep. Um, Nick, you're right. Because uh, they ended up uh, two down for a while on the bench, didn't they? They had another. Yeah, they did. 
So that that would have affected them. But I, I felt, irrespective of that, um, I felt like we took control of the the, the game in, in terms of the way it was being played. We started to play it more on our turns. We were able to get uh, our run going and uh, there's some really noticeable uh, influences in our game style when we're going well. Brody Smith has such an impact on oh, the game when he, when he can get free and not be uh, too shackled by defensive responsibilities. And uh, his his ability to cut through lines and, and, and just catch the opposition out of position with his kicking um, ha- has a real impact on the game. And they yeah. didn't tag Laird. No, they didn't. But, um, Brody Smith, you know, he was outstanding and I thought our best player. 700-odd uh, metres, that's just outstanding. And yeah. uh, That last I, one just waltzing through the pack but with the it, kick to Tex was beautiful. But it, when he makes one of those bursts, the crowd, the crowd lifts. The noise lifts. Our players lift. He's a very inspiring player. Well, it's very it's inspiring. exciting, isn't it? It's exciting yep. to watch a player just cut through like that. Um, and you know, the interesting thing, Macca, I don't think even even in his good years uh, today up until this year, I don't think we've seen Brody be as influential as he currently is. Uh, we always used to see Agreed. flashes of it and, you know, he'd play little cameos or, you know, uh, I don't know. It just seems to me like since his knee, he's he's made a, a decision to make every post a winner uh, and maybe he's had that epiphany of, it. you know, his career could be over tomorrow, so make the most of it. I don't know, but he's playing with, with a lot more intent. He's staying involved in the game for longer periods um, and he's just such a damaging player now. Yeah, out, you know, outstanding player. Um, let's run through some head-to-head stats to see uh, what's going on with that. And I said to my son, and my son got most things right in the rev-up show that I didn't post until after the game because my computer's a bitch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Cam picked... Adelaide by six odd goals and I picked Saints so never mind but I did say to Cam that I I felt like we needed to get our uh, kick to handball ratio um, uh, leaning towards kicking and that certainly was the case we had 242 kicks to 158 uh, which was in my opinion exactly what we needed to do to be able to cut through their defensive running is to um, clear zones and get the ball moving by foot Um, we ended up with 50-odd more disposals uh, than them anyway, um, and we went at a really good disposal efficiency of around about 76%, uh, 73%, um, which is, you know, anything over 70% is great. Uh, we took 118 marks, including 14 contested, of which I think... Uh, Quite a few seven, of them up forward. 17 marks inside 50, which mm. is really good to see. Uh as opposed to 10 from the Saints. Uh, our clearance numbers were really good. We had 40 clearances to 28, uh, including 14 to 9 centre clearances and 26 to 19 around the ground. Um, you know, that's been the message from Don that we need to get our ground ball and our clearance numbers up, our our coal face work up, um, and we certainly took care of that. We had 152 contested possessions to 135. Um and we also had plenty of the ball uncontested as well, 246 to 225. So, um, you know, after a slow start inside, uh, we certainly got control uh, of the match. Riley O'Brien did an excellent job in the ruck, I thought. Uh, 44 hit outs to 25. Billy Longer's not the, the toughest opponent he's ever going to come against, uh, come up against. But, but I, Longer I thought was he did actually, really well. Longer was actually winning a lot of those taps, but it's the secondary efforts from O'Brien to put that pressure on, which then also released, um, because we pushed Sloan out quite a bit, that meant Matt was actually doing the back looping role that Sloan normally does. Yeah. And he was making some really good decisions yeah. with some of that forward movement. And, of course, for once we actually had Matt had more metres going than Brad. I actually liked O'Brien's game, actually, to be very honest. Yeah, I did. I loved, I loved his aggression uh, once hit the board you know, after the tap. In the carry on uh, hunting it on the at ground level as well. I, I, I just think he's at the moment. I think he, well, he's definitely improving each week he, he plays, and it'll be interesting to see when Jacobs is ready what they do because I rather like the boy playing. 
Well, he's certainly um, uh, putting every, uh, making every post a winner at the moment. I don't know whether he's the answer, Mac, to be honest, uh, but he's doing everything that you can ask of him at the moment, and he's offering more than Source has been for the last probably two years, in my in my view, in terms of that intensity around the ground and, at, as you said, uh, Nick, those secondary efforts. So, you know, he's doing everything that we want him to do at this stage, and you can't knock the kid for that. Whether he's a long-term solution remains to be seen, but... Um, I I certainly hope that they reward his form if it continues, um, and make Source work really hard to get back into the ones. Uh, yeah, anyway, I would. Yeah, I would too. Look, um, we're still a little bit in, inefficient at times. Uh, our disposals per scoring shot is still higher than it should be, uh, around yeah. 18, 18 uh, disposals per, per scoring shot. And that when you consider that we're using the ball by foot maker, that's an interesting statistic because you would expect that the more metres we cover per disposal, uh, the lower that number should be. So it does indicate that we are a bit wasteful and inefficient still. Well, we I, th- I think a lot of that was the switching we had to do. Yeah, I was going to say exactly that, Nikki. We did a lot of switching you know, to, to create some of those uh, uh, marks inside 50. So a little bit of zigzagging to get there. So I think that's one of the reasons for it, I think. Yeah, you're probably and right. And I was, I, was, I was okay with that that game because... Um, we would switch and if they had covered it over, then we were very happy to switch it back. And often it was that second switch which then opened up the space. And so that meant our players are making good decisions out on the ground. Yep, that's a fair call. Um, I did think there were, there were just periods of the, of the game where I felt like we were um, uh, just overusing the ball a little bit. Um, yeah, we we did a little bit of that. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, but anyway, um, but look, there, there are a couple of villains that cause that though. Um, one of them is uh, and uh, Kelly. Uh, yeah, there were several times where Kelly could have gone, got the ball, and moved it very quickly directly. He didn't. He hesitated, lost the moment, and then had to kick backwards sideways, and then which created that one of those passages. Whereas he could have uh, created an attacking thrust. If he'd moved very, very quickly, it seems to me sometimes he doubts himself, and and but while he's doing the doubting, the the opportunity closes. There's actually a worse one than him, but you're not going to name him, are you, Macca? Well, uh, the lobotomy that's Alex kid. Keith. Oh. No, Alex, Alex Keith. Keith. Alex Keith is the worst for it. He would get the ball, and I and you could see it on the vision that we had a free player, we had that fast movement but he still takes too long. I love what he's been doing. And I do think that he's close to being like so far in the year. He's, he's, he's pretty close to being an all Australian defender in in six games so far this year, but he still takes too long to make that decision, which holds us up. Now he does still do a very nice long kick and we've actually got some contested markers at the moment in the team and our tails are up. So they were actually flying for balls and we were setting up correctly. But I that's a real him. I thought Kelly's actually moving it a lot quicker than what he has. And I think Kelly's actually playing an okay game. But there's a difference him. between moving it quicker and actually being uh, effective. I mean, the only thing that Jake's yeah. doing is kicking it backwards earlier than he used to. Yes, that's right. He used to hold on to it for 15 seconds and then kick it backwards. He's now he's able to make that lot. decision in five seconds. He's been kicking a lot more forward oh, Nikki. than what he has been previously. Well, I've, I've, I've actually been pleased. I've actually been pleased with Jake. I think you're still looking at him in terms of last year. Nikki, I think he's you, actually doing okay. You threw a big red herring in there by talking about the second best player for our side in Keith. <laughs> he was, yeah, yeah, excuse me. He was the second best player, but that's still a major fault of his. That, oh, Nikki, I, that he, he has, used the ball very, very he's, well. He's got it. He's he, no, he. Holds on to it. Now, a lot of the times, because of the way they count the stats, that long kick to a contest is classed as an effective kick as long well, as we get our hands on it. But Nicky the right goes. thing to do. So if you look at his effectiveness, no, but he had free players. We had free players. He then kicks You're to a contest. You're watching it on the TV, Nick. Don't forget that. You're watching it on the TV. I've watched him play live. Yeah, I know. So we all have. He does but... it there as well. It, it's a fault of his. It's the one fault at the moment. Sure, he could do the little Kelly kick backwards kick to the guy on his own, or he could he do does, he, the no, long attacking 16 the first, meter kick. Actually, no, you go back and you watch it. The first thing Keith does as soon as he gets the balls, he looks backwards. 
Well, the one thing I do know, Nikki, is I'm right because you disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Keep believing that, Nika. And we'll leave it at that. Um, it's been pretty good. Uh, look, inside 50, it's 52 to 45, so we didn't dominate in that regard. Um, uh, but our, our ability to mark the ball, I think, uh, assisted. Um, our intercepts were even, 74 apiece. Um, we we uh, gained a few more yardage, probably through uh, Alex Keith's long kicking, uh, 5,640 <laughs> metres to 5'4". <laughs> try try Brody Smith and uh, Rory Laird. Uh, Both playing you, better I, without Miller on the back line. I don't think you could describe Laird's kicking as long and penetrating. Um, no, I know. But look, you know, at the end of the day, I think uh, we just had a little bit too much class for St Kilda. Um, I don't think it means that we're back by any stretch. Um, but um, there's a lot to like about the players' attitude at the moment. And as you mentioned at the outset, Macca, a lot to like about the, the improvement in our delivery and our movement into the forward 50. Um, and I, you have to say that the inclusion of that kid has made all the difference. It has, hasn't it? Because he isn't competing at all. Uh, I mean, it's very clear he kept out of Walker's way. Walker was, was doing a lot of leading forward. Uh, he's giving a different option somewhere else. Uh, but, uh, I, I really do like Hibbelberg, and he competes like buggery rather than standing out the back, hoping it'll go out the back and I can, you know, snag an easy goal. Um, I, I just think the structure's totally different with him there. And I, and I think we'd be crazy to bring Jenkins back at the moment. Oh. Uh, the the thing with Himmelberg is that his leads and his running patterns are he's not running to where Walker is. That's right. He's he's running to a different space. Or as he did with um, one of Lynch's, the I think it's that last quarter mark that Lynch took out. Um, but it was Himmelberg actually putting the block on and then getting out of the way, but just enough to give Lynch that space, really smart forward craft. So whilst he's not getting those um, number of possessions high enough yet, the impact he's ha- having on our forward line is is considerable. Tw- Just 12, needs to pick up his bloody kicking. 12 touches, five marks, two goals, two isn't a bad output from your key post. No, and, and, and uh, he should have had four goals. He should have, yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, I think he offers us more in that second ruck um, than JJ did, even though I thought... Josh had improved in that regard. Elliot, Elliot actually looks like a genuine ruckman when he goes into the ruck. He um, does, doesn't he? And he also offers similar second efforts uh, to O'Brien. So um, that's what you want because you don't want to tail off, um, you know, when that second... I mean, St Kilda got one one tap out of their second ruckman. Um, Longer had all their taps apart from one. Uh, so, you know, you don't want the effort to tail off when you, your lead ruckman has to have a break. And it also allows the lead ruckman to have a little bit more time off the ground. Uh, very good point. Uh, and I think young Himmelberg, well, he, but he leaps and he's not frightened of body contact. And uh, He's an uh, aggressive yeah. bugger. Yeah, he is. He's, he's, he's just got that little bit of shit in him, which I like, And you know, rather than running, as I say, at the back of the pack. The, the one thing I noticed in this game, which I was really, really pleased about, was the way we were contesting those marks. That you could see players were instinctively knowing, it's not my turn to go. I have to stay down for this because they could see who else was coming and they had the, the better option. Whereas previously, like early on in the season, everybody was flying and nobody was down. It was really noticeable this game that there was more talk and more understanding going on out there. Do you reckon it's also more confidence in the blokes that are down there to take a mark, Nick? Um, I think so. I, th- I think those first three those, those first three contested marks and Tex mm, is mm. bouncing around, and as soon as he's bouncing around like that, everybody else left. But I, I don't think the players have confidence in Jenkins to actually compete, so they feel compelled to go, whereas I think if they see Himmelberg uh, you know, going at the contest, they know that he's going to give a contest, so they're more inclined to look for a crumb. Um, and I think that's just one of the intangible differences that it makes having a, a genuine footballer up there um, who has a good instinct for the game and a good, obviously, a, clearly a good understanding of how to be a forward because the the key thing that you guys mentioned earlier was the fact that he you didn't see him running to where Tex was running. He was either making his own lead or making space for Tex to lead or, or Eddie or whoever. So he he really understands how to be a forward. 
Um, and that's, I don't think, something that, that Josh can bring to the table. Anyway, look, let's go through uh, a couple of players. Um, I want to talk about Tex Walker for a second because the other thing that's happened apart from seeing a bloke contest uh, at centre-half forward is Tex Walker is like a new player. All of a sudden, he's that hard-leading, long-kicking, uh, goal-kicking forward that we haven't seen for God knows how long. Yep, and he's up and about. There's no doubt about that. And I, was, I saw him on uh, Channel 7 this morning, um, and uh, he was saying that uh, he he feels really good this year. He said his body was a bit of a wreck last year. Um, that he had, you know, he was carrying injuries and uh, bruises and sores and all the rest of it uh, for the whole of the year. But whereas this year, he said he just feels like he, well, he's, he's not carrying anything. He just he just feels good about playing, and uh, that's being reflected in the way he's playing because he's now he wants the ball all the time. Nikki, oh. No, I mean you can't disagree with any of that, and I and I've said it that the way he was just bouncing around, that you could just see that confidence that he had, and I loved those couple of contested grabs that he took. That kick from Atkins to him, he he called it. He knew there were two Saints players in front of him, but he knew he had them covered, and the way he actually jumped with the knee up just to push the Saints defender um, under the ball. I mean, we know he's got talent but when he starts to fly which yeah for the past three weeks even that north melbourne game i thought this it's just been he was jumping a lot at that and the recap we did on that um and i talked about it then that i could see him jumping and i felt that it's, it's gonna happen soon um and i think he's just definitely going yep can do this this is mine and I do think it, it does have a lot to do with Elliot being down there and a better forward patterning going on. But also we're getting better structure out of that midfield with Greenwood back in there, with Ellis Yolman in there. They actually do deliver the ball nicely into the forward line to well, at, to it, the advantage. It's a good point. And I, I want to see how we work against a team that pushes us wide like uh, Hawthorne and Geelong did early yeah. doors you know we've been Gold Coast basically rolled out the red carpet to us uh, two weeks ago after quarter time <laughs> and St yep. Kilda you know St Kilda more or less did the same there wasn't a lot of pressure on the ball coming into our forward 50 um, and we were able to, to enter the forward 50 from good positions good locations on the ground rather than you know a high kick from the wing because we've got no other option sort of thing so uh, we're not out of the woods yet because I don't think we've come up with a t- come up against a team yet that is uh, uh, disciplined enough defensively to stifle our forward fifty entries. Um, so uh, it's good. Uh, it looks great. Uh, uh, the crows always look great when when the game's been played played on our terms. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, you know, and I and I'm I'm positive and happy and all the rest of it. But I won't be sold. Um, that we've turned the corner until we come up against a team that has really good defensive structures. A- I, I, I think we've half turned the corner, half turned the corner in the sense that um, we, even against some of the lesser sides, we weren't playing as, as good as this. And I think we've, we've got our game plan and our game style uh, going much, much better than we did. But you're a hundred percent right, Feed, in the sense that. Uh, it counts for naught if it doesn't work against teams like Collingwood and Geelong and uh, some of the some other Giants and teams like that. Um, and we did beat the Giants, but we and I don't think I thought we weren't too bad against Geelong. But um, but I, you can see that we uh, we're getting our game back again, and uh, I think then with Greenwood back in there and uh, a more contesting beast in Himmelberg and uh, slightly different structure up in the forward lines. Uh, I, I think we are going to go well, uh, basically, in most games. And I, I think I'm quite confident now for the showdown, where I wasn't going back a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, it's the long run, isn't it? When, once you're playing against the very, very good sides, will it work then? The ones that work you out and shut you down. I would say we've got a nose just partly around the corner. Um, so we've started that turn. <laughs> But um, 
for me, those past two games, and whilst people are going, oh, yeah, we beat nobody, whatever, those two teams did challenge us. We weren't getting the game on our terms the way we wanted to. Not early. And we fought. Not early. but And we fought back to turn it onto our terms. We restructured. We pushed those um, teams into places they didn't want to be, which then gave us the space on the ground that we wanted. That's what I found pleasing is that we took something that was happening, that we were close to being, like particularly in this game against State, close to being blown out of the water by it because it's that fast break. We don't like teams who can do that and we managed to nullify it. And they tried and they tried and they tried and we kept our structure, we kept our space, really pleased on the way the defence has for the past couple of weeks not get sucked up, which is right. what really good the problem point, was Nick. at Hawthorne. Really good point. We're not over committing. Uh, even even our, our mids are not over committing anymore. Um, we, we've got a slightly more, def- not a defensive mindset, but an eye towards um, being set up defensively. Um, I think we have some key, we've identified some key ball movers. Um, and rather than everyone just rushing forward and, and the backs being sucked up the ground, as you mentioned, we're, we're, we're holding fort um, and we're, we're utilising two or three different players uh, to, to be the key instigators of that transition. And it means that we're able to cover the ground and, and spread defensively better when the ball's coming out the other way. And we weren't allowing St Kilda the amount of fast transition that they got the previous week against against Melbourne. Um, and it was only that fast transition that allowed them to beat Melbourne because they don't have a lot of targets up forward. I mean, if Membry's kicking four goals, it means you're getting the ball in quick because he's not going to win one out too often. Just and talking about... Bruce just could not compete with Talia. No, Bruce is... No, Talia did a good job. Bruce, oh, Talia... Bruce is a disappointment in it since he came onto the scene, I reckon. He's had some good games, but I thought that yeah. uh, Talia would just had wore him like glue. He... I mean, it, it almost looked like he was doing something indecent to him. He's that, that close to him all the time. He just couldn't get away from him. A bit like the and, James uh, Harden defence. Have you seen that one? Uh, uh, I haven't. No. So James Harden is a, a an NBA basketballer who's renowned for a step-back jump shot from outside. And so, uh, uh, who was it, Nick? Utah, uh, they are playing him in the playoffs. They were actually defending him from behind, calling it the doggy style defense. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't do it. <laughs> I love it. I never never, love never it. seen anything like it because he's such, so good on the step back that uh, they're actually guarding the step back rather than guarding in his face. Unbelievable. Uh, anyway. Yeah, cat, the classic. But I, I, I think Tali was a good form, a good Nick. Um, and uh, I thought Alex Keith... Bloody gave up the last two goals. And Alex Keith, uh, uh, his intercept marking was excellent. Um, excellent disposal all day, Nicky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, Still took uh, too bloody long. No, look, he is a very measured player. I, I've said to you before, the one thing I really love about him, he is a non-panic player. He's a thinker. And uh, as opposed to the guy... <laughs> How the pop bloody Hardigan. But that's the problem, you say. There, 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 there were two occasions where Hardigan had to think because he had so much time. And, of course, you know what happened. He messed up twice and gave away two goals because that, he, the guy just can't seem to think when, he is, when he's got think time. Well, he's, he's okay when he's got no time. A couple, couple of strange selections, I reckon, and Hardigan was one of them because I didn't feel as if we matched up terribly well down back with... with Kyle on the team and the other one I was actually surprised that they bought Gallucci in instead of Chase I actually expected them to bring Chase in for a bit of defensive running but um, and, and didn't see much of Gooch to be honest he didn't seem to he was very there much was... playing the last person in the in the rotations and uh, didn't, didn't get much of a look in I, I was just a bit surprised that they didn't play Chase Jones I did read a report from someone who was at the game and they said that um, just being at the game and actually they took a point to watch Gallucci um, quite closely. His one percenters and his running, the the pressure that he was creating caused a lot of the, the turnovers or stopped them trying to get that fast break moving on. 
I do think he might be the one who gets dropped out this week. Oh, um, Paholke. No, pa- 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 yeah, oh, I thought it – Not up to it, not up to it, Nicky. Well, he's playing no. in the wrong spot. He's playing up forward and that's not his spot. He's an in and under midfielder, but unfortunately we've got Sloan, we've got the two Crouchers, we've got Gibbs. That's the problem for Paholks is that that's his role um, and that's his best place to play him. But we've actually got some players who are playing okay in those positions and they're not going to get dropped. That's that's the problem with Paholki, unfortunately. I do um, agree with you about the Gooch, though, Nicky. Um, uh, I thought that uh, Fiend's right in the sense that he never got – I think he got about 17 possessions, something like he that. He did get a goal too. And uh, – but I, I thought that he did do a lot of the little hard work, hard hard working stuff, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I would I'd I'd play the Galucci again on, on on his game, but I think he he will develop every time he keeps playing. I, I had no trouble with Gooch playing. I I think Gooch deserves a spot, and I'm glad that he was in. I was just surprised that when when they made the, when they had to make the choice to replace Bryce that they went with Gallucci instead of Chase. But I'd have them both in, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, there's, probably, there's probably a couple of others that deserve it. Now, look, just before we continue, I have to mention, obviously, that uh, we're currently being sponsored by uh, Smith Partners Real Estate uh, and also Down to Earth Electrical. Um, thanks to Ryan. I think Ryan might be listening in on Facebook, uh, if you are. G'day, mate. And uh, I think uh, if I can keep him out of bed for long enough, uh, he'll join us on Tuesday night. But we do appreciate the support of all our um, supporters, um, Smith Partners Real Estate up there at Golden Grove and also Down to Earth Electrical. Uh, also, we've had support from uh, Hardware on Box, Scorpus's YouTube channel, um, and also in the past, the Strawberry Farm Harvest of Flurio down at Mount Compass. So... Uh, Get around them on our website. There's links to their sites on our website. So uh, look them up. And we also obviously have to say a very, very big thank you to our patrons on Patreon as well. If you want to support the Crowcast uh, on Patreon, then just go to patreon.com forward slash AFL Crowcast or just click the Patreon button on the aflcrowcast.com website. So... I reckon uh, we've just about done that to death. Uh, the only other thing that I would that personally struck me is um, that I, I still I'm still I'm not sold on Riley Knight. I'm not sold on uh, D Mac, and I'm not sold on Rory Atkins. Is there scope for blokes like Shoal and Jones and McHenry? Uh, to get in, to break into this team at the moment, yeah, probably not at the moment. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's a long road still, I think. And look, there's what have we had six games? There's still another sixteen to go. Um, the three that you mentioned, although I, I think in fairness, fairness to David McKay, he hasn't played too badly. Hasn't um, not at all, not at all. Um, it's uh, the best I've seen David play for a while, but. I still, I just still don't know. I mean, Jake Kelly's probably the other one in the gun for mine. I'd, well, have, he, I'd be I, bringing Shaw in for Kelly. Well, yeah, I think I probably would when, too when Brown comes back. Yeah, possibly. I'd, I'd say you know it's either McKay or um, Kelly that goes out, but Kelly's playing the Brown role, so I suggest that Jake might be relegated to a bench player as the swap. It all depends on what we're doing with our wings because we're playing McKay off of halfback mostly um, at the moment. Um, but he can do that those stints on the wing. Atkins is kind of interesting because the commentators were watching him quite closely and they thought he was having a really great game and I'm like, eh. um, But I think we judge him quite harshly. Well, look, um, I think we do actually judge him harshly. Uh, look, he had great numbers, uh, 27 touches, six marks, six inside 50s. You know, I mean, they're, they're all good numbers. Went at 70% disposal efficiency, gained 500 metres, um, you know, four score involvements, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, it, you know, and so it, it's probably a harsh judgment on Rat. Um, but, uh, look, I, I think I'm actually just very burnt from watching the Crows capitulate in high-pressure games. And 
until I see blokes like Atkins perform in high pressure games. I, I'm the, those numbers that they put up are in games where it's free flowing, you know, sort of bruise free kind of stuff. That they, they don't they don't interest me. They don't impress me because that's not what finals football is all about. Well, no, Atkins. but I, but I think Atkins last week was he did a lot more on terms of that pressure kind of game that was going on. And he was doing similar again this week. I think not to the extent that he did last week, um, but there were still some tackles and still um, it wasn't bruise free. Knight actually is an interesting one because uh, I think mean, he's been uh, on the tackle, cast. Nicky. Tackles. Yeah. Too. Not one. He had one. Oh, did he? But I, I, I thought there was a lot more physical pressure from Atkins than what nah. we've seen in the past. No, I can't agree. Um, um, but for Knight, he actually had, you know, he had 15 disposals. So this was actually one of his better games. Um, and he had more than Murphy. And yet. No, 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 no. No, no comparison. Murphy yeah. played a very hard Yeah, no, that's role. what I was about to say, Macca. That the the one percenters from Murphy Outstanding. were a lot more noticeable. Outstanding. Yeah, it's the pressure that he brings, Lockie Murphy. Um, I, I, I mentioned to Cam uh, last week, and I think we mentioned it uh, during the week as well, that it, my impression is that Lockie Murphy is playing for his football career and he's decided yeah. that he's not going to leave any stone unturned uh, in making sure that he stays in the team. I think Lockie understands his limitations and I think he also recognises his strengths. And one of his strengths is his manic defensive pressure. And, you and know, he got three goals. Yeah, seven touches, three marks, three goals. Uh, three goals aside, you'd think seven touches not enough, but the the way the manner in which he contributes to our forward line pressure uh, is one of those intangibles that you can't measure. It's a, it's a it's a non statistical uh, benefit, as yep. Nodes would like to say. Yeah, um, I was about to say hi, David Noble. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, but you're right though. You're 100 percent right because you can't measure because they don't record it. But uh, no, oh, yeah. I think. Lockie Murphy deserved his play. Just on Atkins, though, we ought to call him Forrest Gump because he's like a box of chocolates. You just never know what you're going to get next. Um, and it, it, if you look at his game... Unless you read the label. <laughs> well, well, we know, know what the label is on him. Because I'm not sure he knows what he's going to do half the time. Um, but he... Uh, look, uh, as PJ Crow said, we, we do know what Atkins gives you and so do the coaches. Uh and he's basically an outside player, so you either live with that, or you don't select him. And uh, yeah, but even outside, some of his, sorry, mate, go on. I guess I, but some of his stuff is quite outstanding with his usage of the ball. Oh, no Same doubt. guy can actually drive you insane. And so yeah. it's, it's a question: Have you got somebody better than him? Uh, and I think probably at this stage is not. I just want to see Rory Atkins remain involved in the game as an outside player. I'm quite happy for him to be an outside player and a distributor and all the rest of it. I just wanted to see him uh, maintain his output in high pressure games. That if, if yeah, he can bring I, that, I agree. if he can bring that consistently, and if he can remain involved in games that are tight and close, uh, then I'm I'm happy uh, because yeah. what he because what he does bring to the table in terms of his delivery and his ability to to gut run etc. is uh, is fantastic. Um, but it's no good if he doesn't get the ball, and that's the problem with Rory in high pressure games. So, you know, I, I get, and I guess that's where I'm throwing it out there, not not specifically on on the performances on the weekend, but just in general. It, those, those players are probably the players that I still am concerned about, and you've seen what happens when we stick with players for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden we give another guy a go, and and we see what could have been. We're probably seeing that with Riley O'Brien at the moment. Um, you know, we're stuck with Source for so long and now we're seeing what could have been had we brought in Riley earlier. Um, so I don't want us to hang on to players that aren't going to improve in the areas that they're deficient in. And if Rat and DMAC and, and the, the players that I mentioned can't bring it in high-pressure games, then we'd be better served, irrespective of performance, Macca and Nicky, in my opinion, we'd be better served bringing those young kids in and giving them experience. And ultimately, that might happen too, you know, um it, You're right. He's got, he's, he, had, he plays a certain way and he's got to keep uh, the numbers up, uh, even in the tough games. Um, but 
um, the other guys that are down below, they have to earn that spot too, in the sense that we're not going to put them there just to give them a try. They have to, they have to earn it. And um, I think Shoal is one that probably is starting to earn it, and hopefully they eventually get to try. Um, the other McHenry, how, what about him, Nicky? How is he doing? Um, I didn't see the SNFL game, but uh, by the reports that I have read, um, he was like a little jack in the box and was after everything. He's got the, the lovely bit of mongrel that we they quite like, and he gave it to the umpires at one stage when he didn't get the free when he should have. Um, he needs to actually learn <laughs> that that's not going to happen in the SNFL, but you know, keep trying. Um, I, I think if Ned comes in, it's actually at the expense of somebody like Knight or Murphy. Um, it's that no. smaller forward role. No. Um, he, he's like a little energizer bunny. Um, reminds me a bit of um, Sloan in terms of just that little terrier after the ball. Where's the ball? Where's the ball? Where's the ball? And, you know, if you get in his way, he's going to barrel through you to get, get to the ball. Um, the one game I have seen live, really great voice on the field um, in keeping the team up, et cetera, which is unusual in such a young player. Shoal, I really, really, really want to see him in the team, but he is very light-framed. That's the only knock on him at the moment. Um, but he's very, um, very classy. Hasn't so you think with the- affected him at SAF, SAFL level? No, it, it hasn't um, as much, but that's the step from SNFL to AFL is yeah, even quite... Even bigger, stronger body, Nicky, yeah. It, it, it is, and that's my only one knock, but I think he's... He's making it very hard for them to ignore him with his performances. Yeah, he's, yeah. Certainly, he's certainly playing very well, and uh, and I've seen him a couple of times, and I do like the way he plays. Um, but uh, look, I think I, I think at some stage you've got to you've got to try him for Riley Knight. I think I just think you have to. Yeah, oh, for Shoal, it's either the wing off a half back. Well, yeah, no, I was, sorry, that... I was talking about McHenry. Um, yeah, I th- I think he will. Um, we, I mean, you're going to get an injury option. Um, whilst Murphy is playing for his life at the moment and you can't drop him, there could be, because we saw the strapping with Eddie on his leg, you know, do we give Eddie a rest? Yeah. Um, well, he probably because whilst Eddie didn't have a great before. game, he was still quite influential on the game when oh. it was upward. I thought he had a, fair, a reasonable effect on the game. Yeah. yeah I, th- I thought, I mean, he didn't get huge numbers, but the um, ball hated him. Yeah. Look, I, yeah, I, I think we've we've fallen in, into the the uh, mistake in the past of just running with the same twenty two, same twenty two, and I think you've got to keep tension for spots in the team. And when you've got these peripheral players like Riley Knight that are doing okay, um, but you've got to, you've got to have a look at other blokes, and we've got blokes in the twos. Like I'd really, uh, Tommy Lynch had a better game again. Um, Last week, oh, he had a good, I, I, yeah. I thought Lynch was quite influential in this yeah. game. Yeah, he was. He had a good game. But at some stage, we need to have a look at Darcy, and we need to have a look at Ben Davis, and we need to have. No, a look no, at... I agree. Agree. Yeah. Fogs is to me is just a waste because it, it, you know, number twelve draft pick, strong. We played him some games last year, and he performed um, to a reasonably good standard. We should be developing this guy, and you know, just I don't know where I don't know, but. Just seems a horrible waste. Well, it's a waste, and no, no disrespect to Riley Knight at all, but it's an absolute waste to have Riley Knight and uh, Miles Paholke, even Cole Hardigan for that matter, in the ones when you've got Darcy playing twos, because yeah, he could play in point. any of those roles. So, well, uh, you know, we we need to give we need to give Darcy a run. We need to give Ben Davis a, a crack. I think. Uh, or else, or else we may as well get rid of Ben. We may as well trade him at the end of the season because, you know, it, you, this kid's been on there for three years now. He's shown what he's got, um, and we need to give him a crack. Uh, Tyson Stengel was another one um, that could easily come in for a Riley Knight. So, and this is what I mean where I say that blokes like Riley Knight are playing for their careers because we're not getting huge numbers from him, and he didn't play badly on the weekend. But this is more a general comment. 
you know, is he part of our best 22? And we, mm. don't, we don't know what our best 22 is if we've got blokes in the twos that we haven't tried. It's a good point, very good point. And uh, at some time stage, right, you, you really would like to see them, not all in once, but just perhaps, you know, one uh, one at a time, just try it. If they, if they really succeed, they stick. And if they don't, they, uh, they go back. Kaholki, I, I thought, look, um, he, I, we, Nicky says he should be played on ball. Um, I, 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 I just didn't, never noticed the guy at all. I'd agree with that. You play him in position or you don't play him. I, I just got to say quickly that um, we've had uh, Paul Wood is listening to us on Facebook uh, live on the plane from Sydney to Adelaide. This uh, this media <laughs> nice. never this That's media dedicated. never sees never ceases to amaze me. So <laughs> thanks for joining us, Paul, and everyone else on uh, Facebook too, Hamish and uh, Darren and Warren and. Uh, Marty and a couple of others as well. I reckon Adam's there as well. So I reckon even Pete might be there tonight, having a listen, ready to tear us all to strips on Tuesday night. <laughs> Look, anyway, I think we should... Uh, uh, I mean, we could go on forever on that one, but uh, I think that's probably a Tuesday Night Live discussion. Um, so in the end, what are your final thoughts, Macca? Was it a, a win that's jump-starting our season or is it a win that we should have had and it's not, you know, let's not carry, get carried away yet? Well, I've been watching the Saints, and I think that they uh, so far this season, and, and there's no doubt that um, they've had a, a couple of decent assistant coaches go in there this year. And I know that sounds a bit disrespectful to their coach, but we know how they played last year with that with that coach. Uh, but they've had two very good assistant coaches go in there and with good brains, and they've been playing very good football. So we have actually beaten a team that was playing very good football on their home ground. However, when we look at the makeup of that particular team, there's nothing, there's no, uh, Saint, no St Kilda don't have any new stars in that particular side. The, uh, so really it is the St Kilda of old that finished right down the bottom that's been regenerated by uh, better coaching and better use methods of uh, work of, of uh, attack and Game plans just been worked out by better people, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. So um, to, to suit the players that they have, and they do have some high draft yeah. picks. So there. basically, what we've done is, we, I think, having said that, we should have beaten them, and given all the things that uh, who they really who they really are, uh, even given the fact they've been improved by the people handling them now and play and playing a better style of football. Yeah, I'm with you, Fee. We won't know until we beat better sides. And uh, and that uh, I, we did, but the one thing I did like is the fact that even though we won, we didn't win ugly. We we actually got our game game plan going, gave away two easy goals at the end, but dominated the game from quarter, really from quarter time onwards. Ten, oh, no, onwards. 10, minutes, 10 minutes into the first quarter. Yeah, well, I was, I wasn't going to, I was going to be a little bit generous, Nicky, and just. <laughs> Allow the first quarter to do its, uh, its part, and in the last three in particular, well, I've just it was our game, and uh, it, got, it enabled us to get things going. And some of our players are more up in and about than they are last year, but I'm still not convinced we're going anywhere until we beat better sides. Um, I actually tip the Saints because yes, for me I. they're a side I didn't. that worry us because of that speed. They've never so they beaten us, Nicky. We've got a better than. No, but I do think they've started to turn that corner. Nicky, well, our average um, winning margin against them is 53 points, and they haven't beaten us for about 11 games. Yeah, but as you said, they were a poor team last year, but with that quality, they've got a new structure. They're actually playing well, and they're playing to their strengths. What I liked about the game and where I think it is a turning point, and it's what I said earlier, the fact that we weren't getting things going our way, very much we're not getting things going our way. Few little adjustments are made and they're often made on field and we started to work hard to get it turned back our way and that's what I've liked about it. Um, the the one problem, and, and they're mostly saying it in the chat with the Saints, is that the, their depth. After their top among players, they do drop off fairly sharply. But I do think they play quite an attractive game of football, but they play a game style that worries our game style. 
and the fact that we were able to counter it, get it on our terms and not allow them to get control back for the majority of the game except for a couple of lapses um, in the last quarter, which we could have had 117%, but instead we ended up with 113. Thanks, Talia. Um, that's what I take out of the game that I'm quite pleased about. Yeah, I think I half agree with you with regards to St Kilda playing a style that, that we don't like. We certainly have a tendency, if we're not sharp, to uh, get brushed aside in, in highly contested games. But I think it's it's the, as I mentioned to you earlier, my my opinion is it's the teams that are well organised defensively that hurt us the most. Uh, the teams that don't mm. allow us mm. to move yeah. the ball the way we want. So as long as we're switched on, we'll match most teams in terms of ground ball, particularly with our current midfield rotations with so many good solid inside players. And we it's, were massively down in the first quarter on ground ball. Yeah, because we weren't switched on. 20 or something. We weren't switched on. Because, and, then, and you know why, Nick? Because yeah. we had a 73-point win last week and the blokes just get a little bit ahead of themselves, which is what the Crows always do. So yeah, it was sadly. Good. And I think that's why Pike came down to the bench, apart from uh, getting away from the... Uh, the, uh, the <laughs> was that I think he needed to he needed to talk to the blokes coming off the rotation to say yeah. to to give them that feed that statistical feedback uh, so really that they liked, knew that they were they were behind the eight ball there. Really like the coaching you could see he was doing with those junior players of ours. Yeah, so um, you know uh, it was a at this stage of the season a win's a win. I guess, um, and it's a long way to go. And it was nice to see an attractive brand of footy. It was nice to see us overcome some early adversity. Um, and you can only beat the team that is put in front of you. So you can't complain about any of that. Um, but I'm certainly not uh, declaring, <laughs> making any making any uh, rash declarations at this stage other than to say that it's nice to see a few blokes playing with some good energy and uh, hopefully it continues. Um, and just to finally end something off, a donkey special that he mentioned earlier um, in the chat was that the past two weeks we've beaten the team that's sitting second on the ladder yeah, and we're playing right. the team that's second on the ladder this that's week. That's right. Well, and it's another, it's, a, it's a, exactly the same kind of game next week. It's a, ga- it's a game against a team who are probably surprised, surprising people in terms of where they sit on the ladder. And it's and it's because the fixture hasn't played out yet, so uh, you know it's a game that we should win. Uh, it's but it's a game against a team that are working hard at the moment um, and have the results on the board. So uh, um, you know what looked like an easy stretch of the fixture in terms of the table isn't really an easy stretch of the the fixture. You wouldn't have said that we'd be playing. Second second spot three weeks in a row when you look mm. at that fixture. So, Very good point. Very good. Uh, it's quite interesting. Anyway, look, Nikki, it's good that you're here um, because it's time for the cockwomble. And I can't hear the music, so you're going to have to tell me. Well, it's I can't hear it. I'll just pretend I can hear it. All right. Stop talking over the music. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Um, I think there's only one cockwomble in the the week, and it has to be whoever instructed the interpretation of holding the ball for this weekend to the umpires because it was absolutely shocking, and we saw it (laughs) massively in the Anzac Day game where at one stage it was was a clear holding the ball, absolutely clear holding the ball. Every single player stopped on the field, and there's the field umpire going, play on. And they're all just like, what? Yeah, the whole, the whole game stopped. It was a free. It was actually ridiculous. But they actually, the umpires say that on review that he actually handled that ball as he was going to ground. And that's doesn't what matter. He had how much time beforehand no, to no, do no, it. No, no, does, no. It does matter. It does matter. Oh, they've bloody changed the interpretation again. Well, Nikki, let, let's look at it objectively, all right? If a guy has dodged and weaved and then gets tackled and gets rid of the ball in the act of in the in the event of being tackled, then it's play on. Mm. It's only when he then it what what it does mean when he's been dodging and weaving is that he doesn't get as much leeway from the umpires once he's been tackled, but he disposed of the ball as he was being tackled. So as much as it was a contentious one, uh, the 
my, my query was, did he get rid of it um, legally? Uh, not whether it, he got rid of it in time. Um, because I thought it might have just spilled from his hands, in which case it, sh- it definitely should have been a free. But, um, you know, this, this is where the game is such an emotive one because we all see it differently. But in, in, in my opinion, based on how the law reads and how footy's been played, he got tackled and he got rid of the ball. That's play on. They've, yeah. a- they've actually changed that ruling. I don't th- Not the ruling, Nicky, the interpretation. No, they, they have actually adjusted the wording of the ruling from when I was umpiring and, and even because I've, I've been looking at it over time. They, they keep tweaking a little bit, but there was even more of an interpretation put on it this weekend. I was say, Nikki, Once I watched that game the it, and then like an as as well, there were some clear <laughs> holding the balls yeah, that were not paid to either side. Yeah, Mickey, you know as well as I do, it doesn't matter what's written, it's what the interpretation is. And, and that's and, my cockwomble. And the inter- but the interpretation all week, is, all this week has been the same. They've given the player going for the ball a lot more opportunity than they have been. And I'm not against that, by the way, because I think uh, some of the holding the balls are farcical where uh, where blokes got uh, what uh, lucky if he's even sniffed the ball and, he's, and he goes for holding the ball. So... I'm, I actually disagree with you. I, I, I like the fact they give the player going for the ball a lot more time. I think holding the ball is that one rule slash interpretation, sorry, Donk, that uh, is very, very, very influenced by the context of the game and, yeah. the crowd, <laughs> and crowd noise. And I think it's it's almost asking a human being too much to be ambivalent and to be objective as an umpire when you're caught up in such a intense high pressure game with an absolute rabid crowd like we we should be paying our umpires a million bucks each if we're expecting them to be that psychologically cool that they can make a call in a split second like that and be consistent every time yeah i think you're right and just on, on particular umpires uh, uh, that female umpire today uh, i watched her very Hello. closely I, gee, I think she's a very good umpire. What was her name? Oh, yep, Nikki? she is. Um, I'm not, uh, Eleni's her first name. Yeah, okay. she's Greek. She's a Greek and person. Yeah, and it's um, it starts with a G. And I'm going to, I think it's Golitis. Um, uh, but and I've actually, probably got that wrong. But I've been watching her since she was in the SNFL. She is an excellent, excellent. She umpire. really is. She, she actually, she actually just makes very simple decisions. She doesn't. Try to do like Razor Ray, you know, pull out these big ones out of the out of nowhere. Oh, I, I, I really like I really like the uh, what she. You know what you said, th- What you said was the key there, mate. Just making cool, simple decisions. Yeah, yeah um, that's what she did. Yeah, and I and, think and to me, and that's what my cockwomble is: the fact that they obviously changed the interpretation and the instructions to the umpires. Yeah, they yeah. did do that. It obviously was not. Um, explain to the clubs and the players well enough because it wasn't just that one game. It was also in our game and it was in a couple of the other games that I watched. And, it's, and you could just see the players going, but we know this is not how you've umpired every other game. It must be and, incredibly frustrating as, an, as a player to have yeah. to deal with these continual adjustments to interpretations. Sorry, Doug. Um because... And I know they make the, the interpretation changes every week. There is a new focus yeah, every they have week. A bloody, mm. They have a bloody meeting and they have a rule of the week. <laughs> yeah, and they decide like, this is the rule of the week. So yeah. all you have to do, smart players should actually watch the first game yeah. of the round and go, oh, that's the way they're umpiring. Yeah, that's we right. We have to adjust the way we play. Look, the only other Cockwell Moore nomination for mine is Stephen Hawking with his bloody uh, efforts to manipulate human behaviour and control booing and then oh, yes, you know, have, that get, get the shits on with uh, how we talk about the umpires when he's the one that actually made it so difficult with the umpires uh, for the umpires in the first place. So uh, Pete talked about that on, on Tuesday night and you, you went around to uh, provide the award. So I'm putting him up on Pete's behalf <laughs> tonight as a Cockwomble nominee, Nicky. I, I think it's an overall umpiring issue <laughs> that's going on there. Um, but I, yeah, I do think I like the, re- the reaction regarding the booing is like, oh, get your hand off it. Oh, look, it's just so precious. I, I just, I really wish. I, I, look, I think that 
uh, Hawking's comments regarding, you know, the, the treatment of Gary Ablett and the treatment of Adam Goods and the treatment towards the umpires and all the rest of it. it I'm just, sorry, Gary Ablett bloody deserves to yeah. be booed. Well, it just, to me, it just, it, it's indicative of how much the AFL want to control the product. If we're getting to the point now where the AFL want to control crowd behaviour, then uh, I think they've just jumped the shark a little bit because humans will be humans and we've been booing at the football for 100 years and we'll continue we to boo. We boo when an op- opponent, opposition player is kicking for goal to try and put them off. It's, it's, of it's the there's, one there's thing... There's no maliciousness in no. it. It's the one thing that you can do without without racially vilifying someone or, or being homophobic or, or sexist or anything. It's just... So we're, it's, we're, and we're not allowed to boo somebody who is homophobic. It, it's, no, or or proved right. of a homophobic. That, that's right. It's a, All it is is a, is a voice of dissent. And humans have been expressing that for 100 years at the footy. And Gillen, Steve and the rest of you at AFL House, they're going to continue to do it whether you like it or not. And uh, if they start cutting people out on the back of uh, a, a boo, then we, we may as well stop going to the footy. I, I do also think that the reaction to that Anzac Day game, compounded by <laughs> that it, those interpretations that were happening, was also part of that um, being told they shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you don't tell an Australian crowd they shouldn't be doing something. Never yeah. ends well for you. The unfortunate you. thing about that, though, is that... Uh, uh, and, and I'm a booer from way back, and uh, <laughs> but it was unfortunate that it was Pendlebury was making his speech when they were booing, and and he was thanking the crowd. And yeah, he, he, well, actually, he was thanking the crowd at the very moment that they booed him. And but they, but they didn't; they weren't really booing him. They were taking their frustration out because uh, that's right. It was meant at the umpires, yeah. but uh, as Simon Moyle quite correctly said, the boo was at the wrong time because it shouldn't have been while Pendlebury was actually speaking because. Pendlebury was trying to just make the normal speech that he'd done. And Pendlebury was best on ground, 38 possessions. I thought he had a mighty game. Oh, Grundy and was close. At, uh, well, well, Grundy was certainly a very, very perhaps even more influential. P- PJ Cross uh, makes a good point. Sorry to interrupt, Mac, but just while we're on this topic. PJ Crows makes a good point. He says, of course we boo, we also cheer. And when you consider that, no, uh, is it going to get to the point? That's a good point. point. Is it going to it get to the point, point where we can't cheer because it makes the opposition uncomfortable or makes them feel bad about themselves? Or like, I mean, it's just the whole thing's ridiculous. And I don't yeah. want to talk uh, more about it. Anyway, Nick, who do you reckon? I reckon Hawking, just the, the whole the booing stuff that just, was going just on. Just Hawking in and, general. And the overreaction of Hawking regarding that and the media, yeah, but mostly no, Hawking. Mostly, mostly, mostly hocking. <laughs> <laughs> mostly. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, I think we might leave it there. Look, thanks, everyone, on the chat. Again, another 300 comment night. It's just very solid on a Sunday night. Thanks to everyone who joined us on Facebook. Uh, that's growing nicely. Don't forget that you can watch uh, or listen on demand anytime at spreaker.com forward slash user forward slash AFL Crowcast or facebook.com forward slash AFL Crowcast or our YouTube channel uh, or you can you can access all of our media on our website at aflcrowcast.com. Thanks once again to our major sponsors for this month, uh, Ryan down at Smith Partners uh, Real Estate. Uh, for all your real estate needs in the, in the northern suburbs, uh, he's based at the Golden Grove Shopping Centre. Um, contact details are on our website. Uh, you can click the link. Uh, also, Down to Earth Electrical for electrical uh, stuff. They do a good job. Um, and thanks to our patrons as usual. Nikki, Macca, thanks for joining me tonight. It's been a good discussion. Lots of lots of uh, positive stuff to talk about this week. Yep, pleasure as always. Night all. All right, we'll Night see all. you on Tuesday night for Tuesday Night Live. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>